Intrigued? You should be, because even Marilyn Monroe was nothing compared to Jean Tierney. This sophisticated green-eyed brunette transitioned from high society to the big screen, but Hollywood took its toll, leaving her chewed up and cast aside. The most beautiful woman in movie history was what Fox head Daryl Zanuck said about Jean Tierney. Hard to argue there, yet can you believe me when I say that Jean Tierney had serious self-esteem issues? After her first film screening, she was horrified by the squeaky sound of her voice, thinking she sounded like an angry Minnie Mouse. To change her voice, she took up smoking, and that stuck with her for most of her life. If you're curious about the real Jean Tierney, you're in the right place. In this video, I'll reveal what you didn't know about her. To ensure you catch all the intriguing stories, I recommend subscribing to our newsletter. You'll find everything you need in the linked description box. It's quite intriguing, isn't it? She's dubbed the Get Girl at the peak of her fame. Why? Because Get is right there in her name, and she consistently got what she desired. Despite being Hollywood's most beautiful, her lack of self-confidence turned her into the most underrated actress. It's interesting how what you see on screen doesn't always align with reality. That's why I've delved into some serious research to uncover the real Jean Tierney behind the screens. Just a heads up, you might want to brace yourself for the end of the video if you're feeling emotional, as it's a real heartbreaker. Self-esteem issues or not, Jean Tierney had the guts to turn down the famous billionaire. Howard Hughes tried to date her, but she said no thanks, and they ended up being friends forever. And you'll see how right she was to say no. She could count on Howard when she needed him most, and she couldn't count on anyone else. But we'll get to that. Now let's rewind and kick off the Jean Tierney story from the very beginning. So, Jean Eliza Tierney, a real New York girl, well, sort of, was born on November 19th, 1920, right in Brooklyn. Her dad, a loaded insurance broker, and her mum, a gym teacher, decided to settle the family in the fancy town of Westport, Connecticut. Jean's teenage years were something else. She did the whole international school thing in Switzerland, where she not only picked up French, but also hung out with other fancy-pants young ladies. Back in the US, she enrolled in Miss Porter's school, a prep school with alumni like Gloria Vanderbilt and Princess Anastasia of Greece and Denmark. Quite the high society resume. She was used to luxury from the very beginning. While lots of actresses hustle for years, dreaming of their big break in Hollywood, Jean Tierney had a different story. On a family trip to the West Coast, they stopped by the Warner Brothers. Director Anatoly Litvak spots this teenage beauty and said, You've got the chops for acting. If only we could all get scouted like that. Warner Brothers Studios had stars in their eyes for Tierney when she was just 17, but her well-off parents weren't feeling it. They weren't impressed by Hollywood's low salary and tried steering her away from acting. They thought their daughter deserved better than working for the silver screen. When Jean finally dipped her toes into acting, her parents insisted she hit the stage before the camera. So what's her debut role? a somewhat dull water carrier. But even while lugging around a jug of water, Tierney left her mark. People said, Miss Tierney is the most beautiful water carrier I've ever seen. Unlike her parents, she felt very much ready for Hollywood, and not just Hollywood. On September 24, 1938, Tierney made her grand debut in society, as you do. She was 17, the ideal age to declare to the world, I'm ready for marriage. Imagine the 17-year-old Tierney saying this and totally believing it. Funny, isn't it? But you know girls mature earlier, and Hollywood girls even more so. Tierney's early break came in Ernst Lubitsch's comedy Heaven Can Wait, but her time on the set was a nightmare. Lubitsch, a tyrant, constantly screamed at her, leaving her on the verge of tears. When she threatened to leave if the shouting continued, his response was disturbing. I'm paid to shout at you, he yelled. Undeterred, Tierney replied, and I'm paid to take it, but not enough. After a tense moment, Lubitsch burst into laughter, and from then on they got along famously. But Hollywood wasn't all glitz and glamour for Jean at first. 
Back when she started acting, Jean Tierney had a chance to be in a famous movie called National Velvet with MGM, but it didn't work out, so she chose to go with 20th Century Fox. A cameraman once told her she should lose weight, so she even wrote to Harper's Bazaar asking for diet tips. She stuck to that diet for a whopping 25 years. Growing up in the spotlight is like playing a risky game. It messes with your head, making you feel like you could never be good enough. Trying to please everyone? Forget about it. People will criticise you whether it's fair or not, and the damage is done. Jean Tierney learned this hard truth at such a young age. It's a rough ride in the public eye. She was really self-conscious about her looks, especially her supposed protruding front teeth. She even admitted in a 1948 interview, I talk out of the side of my mouth in order not to show my teeth. Fox Studios, known for being image conscious, actually liked her teeth and wouldn't let her change them. Due to her strong compulsion to comply, she was like a style ninja in Hollywood, effortlessly rocking different looks for various roles. She once said, I always had different looks, a quality that proved useful in my career. But you know that if you combine low self-esteem with a compulsion to conform, it will never end well. That's what happened with Jean Tierney. I bet you didn't know about the severe mental illness she had to deal with. Tierney had a lot going on behind her fancy image. She battled manic depression for years, and her messy personal life just made it worse. As her mental health went downhill, work became a real struggle. She couldn't focus and had to drop out of the film Magambo, and to add insult to injury, Grace Kelly stepped into Tierney's role and even bagged a Golden Globe for it. From the 50s onward, Tierney checked herself into mental health institutions and endured some tough shock therapy to deal with her depression. She hated those treatments so much that she went to extremes to avoid them. She even managed to escape from the asylum once, though they caught her and brought her back. During her rough times, Humphrey Bogart was like Tierney's anchor on set. He understood because of a dark family secret. His own sister struggled with mental issues. So whenever Tierney was having trouble concentrating or forgetting her lines, which happened a lot, Bogart had her back, helping her out and being patient. He pushed her to seek professional help too. By the late fifties, Tierney's depression had pretty much forced her out of Hollywood. She even tried a normal job as a sales clerk to ease back into regular life, but it all went south. Someone recognised her and the media went crazy with stories about the once famous star's fall from grace. Tierney was already quite famous, especially for her role in Otto Preminger's Laura, but making that film was like riding a roller coaster, two directors and a lot of chaos. Ruben Mamoulian was hands-off, leaving Tierney to fend for herself on the crazy film set. And I haven't even dived into Jean Tierney's love life. You can imagine a rocky and painful love life didn't do any good for Jean's already fragile mental health. As a leading lady with high society ties, it's no shocker that Tierney had some high-profile romances. In the 1950s, she fell hard for Prince Ali Khan, who was once married to Rita Hayworth. They were all set to tie the knot, but nope, Prince Ali's dad shut it down, and Tierney had to head back to Hollywood with a broken heart. Now, when Tierney met Oleg Cassini, a Russian-Italian fashion designer, sparks flew, but of course her family wasn't having it. They weren't fans of the match, so Tierney had to make a tough call. In June 1941, she risked it all, eloping with Cassini. But hold on, don't celebrate too early. You know it's like whenever things seem good for Jean, that's when life throws the toughest punches. The most heart-wrenching part is yet to come. Tierney and Cassini had two daughters, Antoinette, Daria and Christina, but it wasn't a happily ever after story. Back in the old days, Tierney was going to have a baby and helping out at the Hollywood canteen, but then a sick fan broke the rules and got too close. Sounds small, but it was a big problem. This is what happened. That night, she signed autographs, chatted with people and shook hands to support the American troops. It was like sprinkling a bit of stardust to make the soldiers feel happier. A few days later, Jean woke up with red spots on her arms and face. 
Turns out she caught the German measles or rubella. Back in 1943, there was no vaccine for measles and doctors thought it was just a harmless childhood illness. Little did Jean know that just two years earlier, Dr. N. M. Gregg found out that rubella could cause serious problems for unborn babies. Back in those days, there wasn't the constant news buzz from TV and the internet like we have today. Jean didn't have a clue that her simple act of kindness would lead to such tragic and lasting consequences for both her and her baby. After a week of doctor-ordered rest, Jean got better and headed to Fort Riley, Kansas, to be with Oleg. They spent the next few months getting their Junction City home baby ready and just enjoying their time together. By the fall, Jean was in Washington, D.C., while Oleg was chilling in Virginia, waiting for orders. On October 15, 1943, Jean gave birth to a tiny baby girl, just two and a half pounds. They named her Daria. But Daria wasn't in good health. She was born premature, going blind, and with cataracts in both eyes. After checking out Jean's medical history, the doctors connected Jean's measles to Daria's troubles. Daria had ongoing health problems and was slower to develop. She lost her hearing due to a lack of inner ear fluid and faced mental challenges. Despite Jean and Oleg's hopeful visits to various specialists, they eventually had to face the hard truth. Daria was permanently disabled and needed more care than they could provide at home. Around Daria's second birthday, Jean had this crazy moment at a tennis event. A fan approached her, saying they'd met at the Hollywood canteen during Jean's pregnancy. The woman said that she had the German measles back then and, breaking quarantine, showed up at the canteen just to see Jean. Jean was floored. This woman unknowingly passed the measles to her and it turned out to be the cause of Daria's disabilities. Jean, without saying a word, just turned and walked away, taking it all in. This sad story stayed with Tierney forever. Remember when I mentioned earlier that Jean Tierney was smart to turn down Howard Hughes' romantic moves? Well, it's time to find out why it was the best decision she could have made. He was the one who helped out by paying for all of Daria's doctor visits. It's a whole different side of Howard Hughes, right? All the stuff you see on screen and read in the papers is all about scandalous rumours, never about what really counts. But by then Jean was no longer the naive girl. Even though Tierney was thankful for Hughes helping during rough times with Daria, she still said, I don't think Howard could love anything that didn't have a motor in it but it's still an amazing story. Do you have strong nerves? I hope so, because the worst part is coming up. When Daria turned four, Jean and Oleg had to make a really hard decision and sent her to a place called Elwyn, where they take care of people who need extra help. Imagine how tough that must have been for Jean. After Daria, her life got really tough. Even though she had another daughter who was healthy, her marriage with Oleg ended and her feelings and thoughts became a big mess. She had a hard time remembering things, especially when she was working on movies, and she went through a lot of places that tried to help her with her moods and thoughts. In the fifties she got something called shock treatments, and they made her lose some of her memories. People think she was dealing with something called bipolar depression, which was tricky to treat back then. If Daria was born after 1965, Jean would have had gotten a shot to prevent German measles, and maybe Daria wouldn't have had those problems. On Christmas Day in 1957, Tierney's health issues really took a toll. She found herself on the roof of her mother's apartment in Manhattan, gazing at the 14-storey drop, contemplating her life. Her worried family called the police, and after about 20 minutes, she stepped back inside. It was a tough moment for everyone. In 1946, Tierney and her husband Cassini split up. She didn't let it get her down, though. She started hanging out with famous people like Kirk Douglas and John F. Kennedy. Kennedy? Yes. John also won Tierney's heart, or vice versa. Let's hear the whole story from Jean's own mouth, because she has a lot to share. While working on Dragon Wick with director Joseph Mankiewicz, he threw me a curveball, saying, Turn closely and look into the camera. 
I turned, and there were the most perfect blue eyes I've ever seen on a man. Dressed in a Navy lieutenant's uniform, Jack Kennedy stood near the camera, giving me a smile. I felt like I was in a scene from a romance novel. My heart literally skipped a beat. After the scene, I approached the man with the captivating blue eyes. Turns out it was Jack Kennedy. I was still tangled up in divorce proceedings, but I couldn't help feeling a sense of triumph for wearing a lavender gown that day, one of my best colours. That night I penned a long letter to my sister, gushing about this handsome Bostonian. She responded with humour, asking, Who is meant to fall for him, you or me? Our paths crossed again at skater Sonia Henny's house, Kennedy quickly replaced my date, and in an empty room we shared an intimate dance. He said, I could dance like this the rest of my life. It didn't sound trite. I decided then it would be very easy to fall in love with him. He had that kind of bantering, unforced Irish charm that women so often find fatal, she said. As they talked, Kennedy opened up about his father's past in the movies. He even shared stories about his sister Rosemary, who was mentally disabled. They discovered they had something in common, the shared experience of having mentally underdeveloped family members creating a unique bond. Jack understood, she said. He told me about his sister Rosemary, who had been born retarded, and how his family had loved and protected her. The subject was sensitive for him. The Kennedys did not survive by dwelling on their imperfections. Jean, he said, after a silence had passed between us, in any large family you can always find something wrong with somebody. Despite this connection, JFK and Jean Tierney were destined to fail from the very beginning. Her thing with Kennedy lasted a while, but it didn't end well. Even back then, Kennedy was all about politics and dreaming of becoming president. She really liked him, but Kennedy told her he wanted to be in politics and wouldn't marry her. We were having lunch one day in New York, just before we were joined by some of his friends. He looked at me and said, out of the blue, "'You know, Jean, I can never marry you.' In the chatter, the exchange of greetings as his friends settled into other seats, I said nothing. Then it was time for Jack to catch his flight back to Washington. As he moved away from the table, I sat still, and in a voice just above a whisper, I said, "'Bye-bye, Jack.' He stopped, walked back across the room, and said, his smile a little off-centre, "'What do you mean?' That sounds kind of final. It is. We looked at each other for a long, timeless moment. Then he turned and left to catch his plane. Tierney was upset, but she ended things to keep her pride. When Kennedy became president, Tierney sent him a note saying congrats. But in 1960, she voted for Richard Nixon, not Kennedy. Tierney was a strong Republican and politics meant more to her than old romances. In the 1960s, Tierney tried to be a movie star again, getting praise for roles like Jane Barton in The Pleasure Seekers. But old worries came back, and after 1969, she pretty much stopped acting. But there's something else I've already prepared for you, which probably will have an even bigger impact. Check out this deep dive where I'll explain to you the kinds of sufferings Doris Day had to bear because of her on-screen innocent image, and you'll understand Hollywood's manipulations of their audience even more.